Good afternoon. My name is Eric Rexted. Let me introduce you to um, distance sampling. I'm going to present to you a set of roughly 15 minute presentations that describe some of the fundamentals of distance sampling to you. And you can watch them at your leisure online. So what's distance sampling? In this first, in this first episode, I'm going to tell you a little bit about distance sampling and its relationship to wildlife population assessment. How does this tool, how can this tool be used for estimating animal populations? And I'll try to differentiate distance sampling from one of its relatives, plot sampling, and give you some basics into the runnings of distance sampling. So, in wildlife population assessment, the objective, of course, is to try to come up with an estimate of the number of animals in a particular area that are, that are of interest to you. Beyond just knowing what the population is up to at any given instant in time, it's common for resource managers to want to know what direction populations are headed. Are they trending upward? Are they trending downward? If indications of trends can be deduced, then as good managers and scientists, the next question on the list is to try to ascertain why those trends exist. Are there patterns in survival rates or fecundities of the animals of interest that might be causing populations to decline or conversely populations to increase. The final component of wildlife population assessment is not just to look at the moment, not just to look in the past, but to try to project into the future. Try to make predictions about what a particular population might do in the face of certain events. It's common to look at impact assessment to try to make predictions about what will be the consequences to a particular animal population if a certain sort of perturbation takes place. And so those are, in one slide, the aspects of wildlife population assessment. And we'll go on to talk about ways in which we might be able to accomplish that. For distance sampling at the moment, we're going to talk fundamentally about the first point. How many animals are there? Now, there are a number of ways to go about estimating the number of animals in the population. The simplest way, if one is interested just in the trends of the population, is to just, rather than counting the animals themselves, ask people, ask experts who know something about those populations to try to speculate about whether there are more animals in the population this year than there were last year or five years ago. So one way of doing that is instead of studying the animals, study, study experts who can complete questionnaires for you. An example of that here in Great Britain is a survey that's been done on adder, which is the only native reptile, the only native snake to the UK. Questions were, questionnaires were put out to people like game managers or game keepers who spent time in the field and asked, are there more or fewer adders than there were in the past? Another example taken from the UK is a study on otters in which data are actually gathered in the field, but this time, rather than trying to estimate the number of otters that might exist in a particular location, an investigation, investigation is simply conducted to find out whether there are presence, presences or absences. This has become popularized in what's called occupancy modeling that unfortunately we won't have time to talk about. 
An example now taken from the United States are so-called index methods, where there are counts taken repeatedly on an annual basis, in this case for birds, listening to see how many different species or how many different individual birds are recorded on a, on a particular location for a fixed length of time. All of those methods are inexpensive, that's one of their advantages, but they are also, they also have some challenges or some deficiencies. And if trend assessment is what these methods are being used for, you have to be careful that detectability is not changing with time. And so all of these, all of these methods that are when used for estimating trend have to assume that the proportion of the population resident that is detected isn't changing with time. So now let's move on to methods of actually estimating abundance. Rather than using these index methods, what are alternative ways of trying to estimate the size in a more rigorous fashion? the way to estimate the size of a population. Of course, the, the best way, and best also implies most expensive way, is to completely census the population, count everything that exists. Not usually very feasible to perform. If you can't use the gold standard method of comp performing a census, then you're left with sampling methods, such as plot sampling and distance sampling that I'll talk about in a moment. Or other methods of sampling include sampling members of the population, placing marks upon them and releasing them back into the population so that they can be subsequently recaptured and using information upon repeated captures of individuals, perhaps estimates of abundance can be derived. Likewise, removal methods in which you sample the population and instead of placing marks upon the animals and re-releasing them, the animals are simply removed from the population, perhaps by fishers or perhaps by hunters, and the rate of the depletion of the population can be used to estimate what the population size was prior to the time that the removals took place. We'll not talk about the last two, but we will focus our attention upon distance sampling methods, and on our way to discussing distance sampling methods, we'll talk about plot sampling. So here's the complete census method. What you'll see here, and you'll see many slides that look that begin to resemble this, a study area, in this case it's rectangular, with the size of the study area designated with these numbers and dots indicating animals in the population. So we can use these dots as surrogates for population, a population of individuals. One of the things you'll notice in this particular manifestation of our simulated population is that there are more dots in the eastern side of this rectangular study area than there are on the western side of this study area. That's one of the patterns that we can begin to examine when we're trying to understand population size, not just its complete size, but also its distribution, perhaps. So, let's do a quick set of calculations here in which I can introduce some notation to you. N is the size of the population of interest. A is the size of the study region. In this case, length times height, 5,000. And what we're trying to derive is an estimate of the animal density. And that density of animals can be estimated as the number of individuals occupying a study area divided by the size of the study area. So if we employ a complete census, the way in which we come up with our number of individuals is we count all the dots. If you have 
paused and tried to do that on your computer screen, you'd find that there were 412 dots. We can convert that abundance, or population size, into a population density by dividing those 412 individuals by the 5,000 units of area that they occupy, producing this estimate of abundance of about 0 0.08 dots per unit squared. The complete census method, however, is one that we can very seldom accomplish in practice. So if we can't count everything, then an alternative to that is to employ plot sampling in which we subdivide our study area into smaller units. In this case, those units are designated as the green areas. And we count everything inside those green areas. Now what we've done is we've indicated the animals that we do count in red and the animals that we don't count in black. The same pattern of dots as previously, but now notice that all of the animals that reside inside that greenish area are counted by us and everything outside that greenish area is not counted by us. So with that alteration of our sampling method, how can we go about estimating density or population size? Well, first we have to describe the number of plots that we visited, in this case five. We have to figure out what the total length of those plots were. All, each plot is 50 units from north to south. There were five of them, 250 of them. And we also are about to try to calculate the area that we sampled, or the area that we covered, to do so, we need to calculate the strip half width, in this case, the distance between the dotted line and the boundary of our study area. In this case, that strip half width was equal to 1. So with all of those pieces of information, we can calculate the area of the covered region. Notice I've used the small letter A to differentiate from the large letter A to indicate that this is the size of our study area, this is the size of our sampled area, or the area of the covered region. Doing a little bit of geometry, we find out that we've actually visited one-tenth of the study area by multiplying the length of each of those strips by twice W because we were looking both to the left and to the right of the dotted line. In this case, the number of red dots was equal to 36. So with that data, with those data from the field, how would we go about estimating population size? Well, let's work with what I hope is a fairly intuitive estimator of abundance for you. We saw 36 individuals in one-tenth of the study area. What we want to do is we want to extrapolate from the places that we visited to the places that we didn't visit, and we do so under the assumption that the areas that we visited were representative of the areas that we didn't visit. So we have to scale up the 36 individuals that we did see by multiplying them by 10, which is equivalent of dividing 36 by 1 tenth, to make a prediction that the number of animals in the study area is 360. So here's the equation to indicate what we've done. We've taken the number detected, little n, and divided it by the ratio of the covered region to the entire study area. We can rearrange that and bring the cap A out of the denominator up into the numerator and perform our calculation this way. Notice this hat implies that the number that we produce is not necessarily the true number of animals in the study area. It is an estimate of the number of animals in our study area. In this case, we knew 
there were 412 individuals in the study area from the previous census that I had showed you. So we see that this estimate is not exactly accurate. To recap, plot sampling works with first estimating the number of animals in the region covered by our survey effort. And once we have that estimate, we can then use that number to try to extrapolate to the number of animals in the entire study area. With plot sampling, the number of animals in our covered region is equal to the number of animals that we saw because we assumed that we saw everything inside those green rectangles. The second step, assuming we had a randomized placement of those transects, and we'll talk more about that later, if we have a randomized placement of the transects, then our estimate of the total number of animals in the study area is equal to the number that we saw in the covered region scaled appropriately. What I've done in this final step is I've converted this little a, the size of the region covered by our survey effort, to take into account the, the geometry of our sampled region. So we had strips that were cap L in length, and they were little w in half width. We multiplied little w by 2 because of expending effort both to the left and to the right of the transect. And that provided us with an estimate of the number of animals in our entire study area if we used this form of plot sampling known as strip transects, in which everything within the boundaries of those plots were detected. In a second, I'll, ex I'll extend this into plot sampling.